Could you explain what your role is, please? So I am executive director of the Center for International Development at Harvard. And my role is to get the ideas of uh, an amazing group of faculty at Harvard and beyond who are working on issues of eradicating poverty and try to find ways that that knowledge can be translated and used by you know, a wide array of users, policymakers, consultants, multilaterals, everyday citizens. And what what is the objective of your um, organization? Like, what, what, are your, what are the things you're most proud of having achieved? Mm -hmm. Well, the objective of, uh, of our organization, we want to be bold. So we're about eradicating poverty, not about alleviating poverty or making like eradicating poverty. And I think uh, um, most of, of, of the ideas that come out of, uh, of our center, I feel, are kind of changing the paradigm. They're not about slightly improving what's working is let's think about this problem completely differently. And, um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, that uh, uh, people are bold. Um, I'm also, I think if there's one concept that fits a lot of the different programs in the center is that one solution does not fit all. And that is, you know, sometimes everybody wants the silver bullet or the thing that is easy to understand. But no, this is a complicated problem, and I think uh, everybody who works in solutions realizes that you have to get your hands dirty in, in finding solutions. A question I would have asked you after your, your presentation is how do you align the fact that you, we want the, develop, the undeveloped world to develop so it's less poor? Mm -hmm. How do we, a lot of those countries are the ones in the very biodiverse hotspots where their impact on the mm -hmm. environment is far more heavy, unfortunately. How do we weigh up that? How do we find solutions that are win-win for the local mm -hmm. people and for the environment? No, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a good question the world is asking, right? We're at a moment of global warming. We worry about China growing so fast. It has, uh, you know, huge environmental implications. Um, and, and yeah, some are trade-offs, but there are some win-wins. I think that most of the consumption and pollution and consumption of resources happens in, developing, in developed countries. We consume a lot more than people in poor countries. So I, the fact that that consciousness exists and it's taking over in developed countries is going to be very important. And for developing countries, I think uh, there are a lot of initiatives of thinking of you know cap and trade, of sharing technology, of uh, um, you know, as a as a, a buying or being being able as a developed country or a developed country factory to buy emissions by uh, providing better technology in developing countries, right? So there are kind of innovative ways in which I can let developing countries develop, manufacture, but doing it in a cleaner way. As a developed country, sometimes subsidizing that. Um, so I think. We have to think creatively as saying, okay, now that we realize it's a problem, let's cap everybody, is not going to resonate for as many developing countries. But there are um, solutions that require collaboration at a global scale. Okay, inherent to what you presented today mm -hmm. was the idea that growth is good. Is growth always good? Um, it's a, it's a great question because growth has gotten a bad name recently, right? That uh, you can grow in very unequal ways. And, um, and for very poor countries, growth is very important. Because um, first of all, if you don't have growth, you don't have anything to distribute, right? You redistribute poverty otherwise. So you need to expand the pie. And, uh, and if you have people making more money, and these kind of models where I'm suggesting, where people are creating more money by creating products and values and, and, and things that the world wants to buy, those create uh, business models that allow the people creating it, the, the people at the bottom, to get high and rising salaries. So at some point, many of the problems of the poor, healthcare, lack of education, can be solved with money, right? So growth brings incomes to the, to, um, to the poor, to the poorest of the poor. Now, after a certain level, say five thousand dollars or of income, you have to think of other things too, right? To deal with the inclusive growth and the fact that that economies are becoming uh, 
more divergent. And then you talk about tax codes and things that we're discussing in our countries. But I think for developing countries and the poorest of the poor, without growth, we can start the conversation. Okay, could you give me in a nutshell, if it's possible, what the summary of what you presented today was? Um, I think the summary would be this concept of, of, of know-how, of expertise, that countries grow, societies prosper, and this goes at the very micro level, but by adding capabilities, by adding expertise, by creating diversity of knowledge, right? And it's societies through organizations, through firms, that bring that diversity of knowledge together to allow us to make more complex things, which drives growth. So what would be the magic formula if there were five things a, a poor country could do to improve its position in the world and, and for its people, what are those five things? Well, you know, and um, unfortunately, we are all about not best practices. And, uh, and it's hard to find the five things because one of the things that, that, that we say and that we try to map in this theory of uh, the product space and economic complexity that... Uh, um, was created by Ricardo Hausman and others in, in, my, in the center, is that every path for every country is different, right? I worked with a lot of developing countries who everybody wanted to bring the biotech industry or the next, you know, sexy industry that had allowed, you know, Ireland to, uh, to succeed, the BPOs or the call centers. Yet, and they wasted a lot of money trying to pursue the dream that had worked for Singapore or for Ireland 20 years ago, right? But the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, each country is going to have a very different path. And what I like about these maps is that it allows you to understand where are you now? What are the capabilities that you have as a country? And does how, what is your specific path toward development? And I think that kind of context-specific solutions in growth, but in most other things, health, education, are the things that are likely to bring, uh, to bring progress. This is a question from my uh, assistant here. <laughs> are developing countries poor because they have a lot of children or do they have a lot of children because they're poor? Ah, oh, that, um, that is a, um, a great question. There was, um, there's something called kind of the paradox of Malthus, right? That, that uh, the more you develop, the, um, the more children you have because you have more money. But then something happened right, in the, demo in the demography of countries, where the richer they became, they started to have less children. And that, that, that openness allows countries to actually have an acceleration of growth. Um, so a demographic change is important in the, in, in the growth equation, equation. So because as people start having more children, and that has happened to many economies as they, as, as they grow and become more prosperous, you can invest more in, in the fewer children that you have, and the possibilities of those children having a better outcome is, uh, is, is higher. So it goes both ways. So a, company, a country like China right now is having a problem because right. of the, the low birth rate, is, is, is that correct? Uh, yes, well, I mean, China deciding to do it the way that they did it um, um, creates complications, because uh, right, because now you have issues of also the gender imbalance and whatnot. But China had a tremendous growth. It probably has taken more people out of poverty than any other country in the history of the world, right? So it has made great achievements that, uh, you know, probably are also related uh, to being able to manage uh, population. But it's not something that I would say is the answer to development. Um, you know, grow and prosper, you know, and, 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 uh, and there's a natural tendency for those countries to end up uh, having more children, which I, again, help you. And then you have developed countries which have a different problem, right, where you're having shrinking populations and aging populations. And there's where I think uh, uh, immigration can be a great, um, a great uh, asset. What is the most daring thing you've had to do, most courageous thing? Aside from jumping off that train that I talked about uh, um, this, uh, this afternoon, um, 
I don't know if there's something super courageous, but I know that, you know, I started my career after this experience that was a little disheartening in the development sphere. I said, you know, I'm done with development and I went and joined a, an investment bank and I was an M&A banker for a few years in Wall Street. And I mean, it was a great school. You know, I learned a lot. I, um, but at some point I could tell that, you know, knowing which is the next M&A activity in the retail sector in Country X was not making my blood rush. It was not the, the issues that I really cared about. And at, at that point, I decided to, for, to go to the Kennedy School uh, instead of going to a business school, which is what everybody else was doing. And, uh, and that was hard because we, we think we are such individuals, but we get shaped by our environments. And if everybody around you wants to do something, it feels like it's the right thing to do. And at that time, switching and saying, no, I'm, I'm going to do, go do public policy and, and, um, and social endeavors because this is where I think you know, I can make a difference and going against the tide was, was hard at that moment, but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad you did too. Thank you. Thank you very much.